Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. So everybody in this room can, you know, look at a chair and recognize it's a chair. But I send the students home in the course and I say, if you want to understand this, then the assignment is come back here with a piece of paper and a checklist. It can have conditionals and all kinds of things in it that if we coded it with a computer, the computer plausibly could recognize a chair and not make type one and type two errors. You can't do that. Just can't. There's just millions and millions of different forms of chairs. Any list like that, and you can find a counterexample. And it became just transparently obvious that that's not what we're doing when we're identifying objects, whatever they are. And then along comes powerful computing of high-speed networks and digital transformation and the neural network technology. So we've had a whole sequence of breakthroughs that in combined, I think, are going to transform pretty much everything. Um, and if you don't believe me, that's because I won't have convinced you in the next few minutes. The global economic outlook in the future is going to be uncertain with wide disruption in all walks of life. The accelerating progress of AI comes at a pivotal moment in the global economy. AI and automation may offer a broad-based surge in productivity, resulting in all-round development and a more positive outlook. But to harness the true power of an AI-powered economy, a robust policy framework that fosters collaboration and enhances human potential and responsible management of data is required. In this episode of BIC Talks, economist and Nobel laureate Michael Spence is in a conversation with educationist and CEO of Azim Premji Foundation, Anurag Bihar. This is an extract from an in-person event that took place in the BIC premises in February 2024. And now, over to Dr. Spence. I was in uh, India just before the pandemic hit. I left at the end of January in 2020. By the time I got back to Milan, which is my home at the moment, uh, we had a probably the first serious outbreak in the West. And I so it's a thrill to be back. And it's especially fun to be back in India at a time when things are, many things are going well. Um, India, among the major economies in the world, is the one with the highest potential growth. And it looks like the actual performance is at least pretty close to potential. So what I'm going to do today, I wrote a book with Gordon Brown, a former Prime Minister of Britain and my friend Mohammed Alarian on, it was called Burma Crisis. And it was an attempt to try to bring into focus a pretty complex environment that we're living in globally, in which at least three things are going on. One of them is this persistent, increasingly frequent severe shocks in the form of crises, pandemics, wars, climate shocks, and so on, some of them financial, if you go back a little bit in time. And so that's one set. Second set is some very large secular, meaning not cyclical, structural changes in the economy that we argue uh, are major headwinds to growth. These include declining productivity, aging in 78% of the global economy in terms of GDP. I know that may sound a little strange when you live in a country that's as young as this one, uh, but the young countries are have 60, roughly two-thirds of the world's population, but about 22% of its GDP at this point. Now, 20 years from now, this picture may look very different, uh, depending on who grows and by how much. Uh, but that's the situation now. And there are many more headwinds. So they, we thought there was lots to talk about, but we didn't want it to be depressing. And at least the way I see the world, the third major set of things that are going on that are relevant powerful forces are a set of scientific and technological transformations underway. And the three that I talk about in the book are the digital one, multi-decade, many chapters not finished by any means, 
a somewhat less discussed but nevertheless very powerful revolution in biomedical and life sciences, and then this huge energy transition that we are going to have to go through in order to achieve sustainable patterns of growth in the future. So that's kind of, if I had uh, half a day of your time, that's what I would talk about, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the last part, and in particular about the digital part, and even more specifically about um, artificial intelligence. And so let me spend a few minutes doing that, because I think it'll be a lot more fun for you when we engage in conversation about this with each other, and then eventually uh, with all of you. Now let me see if I can make this thing. Well, that's interesting. So these are the major transformations I just mentioned. Um, there's a fourth, which is, the, is actually economics. It's the growth of the emerging economies, populations mostly in East and South Asia, shift to the center of gravity of the global economy to Asia. And this has, you know, easy to say, enormously important in implications, the distribution of power, um, an influence in the global economy, the rise of tensions, you know, as the rising powers challenge the dominance of the, you know, incumbent, et cetera. But that's not what we're doing today. So what I'm going to do is show you at least, a, I have a long list of, and this is by way of preface, of scientific sort of tools and technology tools that are path-breaking, but more importantly, from the point of view of the way our economies perform, they are increasingly widely available and their costs are plummeting by a, like a stone. And there are a lot of them. But the point of this is that the human capital of the world is increasingly being handed a set of incredibly powerful tools um, to alter growth patterns, to accelerate productivity, to accelerate progress in biomedical science, etc. cetera. Uh, now, you know, I didn't want to sort of take an aside and take you through all those. This is one, obviously. This is TSMC's semiconductor map. If you have an iPhone in your pocket, it's a five nanometer chip. There's probably two entities in the world that can make those right now. It's not a very stable situation. Uh, if I had more time, the, uh, the, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, there's a, another number up there, up on the right-hand side here. This is a three, nanome three nanometer chip. And then there's a number under it, and then that number is 291. And what, what that number is, is the number, the, the number of transistors, read switches, in millions per square millimeter on the chip. This is really hard to understand how powerful these things are, and, and I think it's fair to say we're not done. I'll spend a minute on this, because I don't know how many of you have followed AI closely over lots of years. I would say 15 years ago, the current version of AI based on a kind of analogy with the way the brain works, neural networks, you know, deep, deep algorithms that pick off patterns and so on, was available in theory. But there were three things missing. Enough digital data, enough networks to move that data around so it was accessible in fast networks, and most importantly, the uh, computing power to implement those models. So let's drop back. The previous version of artificial intelligence was actually quite influential. If you look at the way the digital economy impacted uh, society, but it was essentially a dead end. So we've had lots of lots of impacts on on economies that have the following characteristic. Machines, humans know how to do something, property one. And property two, we can describe in precise logical steps how we do them. If we can do that, then we can code them, and we have, and then we'll let the machine do it. That's why we don't have file clerks anymore, at least in the developed countries, et cetera. This, is, this led to the hollowing out of the middle class, the elimination of routine white and blue collar jobs, this has all been well documented, right? But in AI, which is an attempt in some sense to reproduce what humans do, the reason that hit a dead end was because there's many things we do, property one, where we cannot 
satisfy property too. That is, we cannot write down precisely how we do it. We just do it. So everybody in this room can, you know, look at a chair and recognize it's a chair. But I send the students home in the course and I say, if you want to understand this, then the assignment is come back here with a piece of paper and a checklist. It can have conditionals and all kinds of things in it that if we coded it with a computer, the computer plausibly could recognize a chair and not make type one and type two errors. You can't do that. Just can't. There's just millions and millions of different forms of chairs. Any list like that, and you can find a counterexample. And it became just transparently obvious that that's not what we're doing when we're identifying objects, whatever they are. And then along comes powerful computing of high-speed networks and digital formation and the neural network technology. So we've had a whole sequence of breakthroughs that in combined, I think, are going to transform pretty much everything. Um, and if you don't believe me, that's because I won't have convinced you in the next few minutes. So we had handwriting recognition, speech recognition, translation. It went from truly dreadful to awful. Fast forward, Gen AI can probably now for a multilingual country, take a newspaper written in any of its languages and produce the digital edition in very high quality form in all its remaining languages at zero marginal cost. Zero. Okay? Think about it, right? What it means in terms of communication, etc. And that's just one tiny corner of what it might be able to do. In the middle here is a thing called image recognition. That's the <clears throat> black line. And that was a really Im impressive thing. That's the, this is the case that I gave you with the chair. Um, and we were trying to solve this problem, or the, I'm sorry, the technologists were, uh, with the old technology that failed. And they adopted the new technology. And it improved at incredible speed. Uh, and around 2015, 2016, the AI passed the average human performance. So let me pause there. We benchmark AIs against human performance. Seems like a perfectly natural thing to do, especially given the name artificial intelligence, <laughs> where they're trying to reproduce us. And Alan Turing, the famous uh, author basically of the computer, uh, they proposed that we test our advance in artificial intelligence by asking an, the following question. Can we produce a machine that when a human interacts with that machine, the human thinks they're interacting with another, interacting with another human? So that's perfectly natural sort of stretch goal. Benchmarking is a perfectly natural way to assess progress, although I do want to flag for the later discussion, there are AIs that are superhuman by the orders of magnitude in areas you can imagine when you have to scan. Um, mountains and mountains of data or do unbelievably large amounts of calculations. There are places where they're about the same as us on average, maybe not as good as the experts. And there are places where they're not quite up to human standards. All of them have their uses. When I'm teaching a course uh, on this stuff, you know, I talk to the students and tell them how we benchmark this. And then I say, well, turns out with a bit of effort, you can use image recognition to recognize skin cancers, but really isn't as good as the uh, dermatologist. And so then I say, well, what do you think of that? And they say, well, it's not very interesting. I mean, it was a nice try, but we failed. And I say, are you sure? And they say, yeah. I wouldn't do, use this. I'm just going to the dermatologist. And I say, 85% of the world's population lives nowhere near a dermatologist. And this, used properly, and by the way, you can take pictures of your skin with your phone, can give you a warning sign under the heading preventive primary care, which will cause you to ride 85 kilometers in a train inconveniently and get yourself checked. But with the, sig this is signaling, um, with the signal that there's actually a shift in the probabilities and you have a problem, okay? So, I would say the discourse around AI at the moment is still very unsophisticated. Uh, 
And the notion that, you know, they're very important inclusive growth pattern type uses, whether they're in education or healthcare or other dimensions of the economy, um, that are uh, available to us in all of these categories, this full range of human relative AI performance in compared to humans. But the benchmarking of AIs um, anticipating something I want to say in a few minutes, has one very, very serious uh, spillover effect, and that is there is a natural, very strong human tendency to say, well, once the AI passes the human, why don't we get rid of the human? And that's the, what I call the automation bias. And you can find it everywhere. When you listen to people talk, are there going to be enough jobs? Is my job going to go away? Hospital administrator starts talking about AI, and there's panic, it was literally terror. But when you go and look at it, there's a certain amount of automation involved in shifting jobs around, parts of jobs, really. Uh, but it's not the natural use of these things. They're prediction machines. They uh, hallucinate if you allow them to. They make, meaning, make stuff up. Uh, they get stuff wrong. They don't know the answers to certain things. You know, lawyers can use them to write a draft uh, brief. Doctors can surely use them to write the first draft of the very time-consuming reports they have to hand in. I'm not talking about large language models. Uh, computer code, the first draft can be written with uh, these things easily now. I mean, this isn't, you know, futuristic stuff. But the doctor's not going to hand in the first draft without checking it. And a, little, a lawyer did hand in the brief in the United States. Only, the only problem with the brief was that all the legal precedents that were cited didn't exist. So this gentleman's in serious trouble. Uh, we probably, you know, there'll be a little learning like this and we won't have many mistakes of this kind going forward. Um, but anyway, it's just a caution, right? Um, that, you know, we got lock onto this. I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, my belief is, at least for a period of time, the natural use of this as a powerful digital assistant or a collaborator to both human people doing various things at work or even not at work and to systems. Now this one is starting to be talked about, but you probably won't have read very much about it. But you know, you can look into uh, global supply chains which are opaque and complex with AI systems that in a way that no human can. We just can't keep track of it. This is superhuman in category. Anyway, so the last set of things here are this growing generation of, of AI um, models that are available to us. Large language models, increasing number of parameters. So chat GP4 would be, I don't know exact number, but it was multiple billions of parameters that enable it to do what it does. They'll become multimodal, meaning They'll handle images, text, poetry, video, interchangeably um, in the not too distant future. Um, why this is image recognition? It was uh, a, a process led by a colleague of ours at MIT named Fei Fei Li. I'm going to just, this is a, sort of an aside, and it does have to do with biology, but it's the intersection of powerful digital technologies, AIs. Uh, with um, biology. So you probably know these folks called DeepMind. It's part of Alphabet because they're the ones who got a computer to win the game of Go. And the game of Go has the property that the number of permutations of th the way the board can be laid out is so large you can't catalog it. Certainly not. Maybe with quantum computing, certainly not now. Um, and that, and they, that was very successful and there was a great deal of learning because the second round of playing the game of Go the machine, they didn't basically tell it anything other than the rules, and the machine played against itself. And, and it discovered things that humans hadn't thought of. It's a kind of creativity, you know. These are unconventional moves that they would make, and every, the experts would look and say, what? Nobody ever does it. Man, turns out some of them, it discovered, were worth it. Their next project was called Alpha Fold, and they, I'm gonna do this briefly, and they set out, for reasons that you can probably guess, to predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins from the amino acid sequence that defines a protein. 
And the reason that's important is because A, it takes a lot of time in the lab, and B, if you don't know the three-dimensional configuration of a molecule, you have no idea what it'll bind to. You can't produce drugs, you, vaccines, etc. It's a core bit of technology in, in uh, biomedical science and pharmaceuticals. And they succeeded. It was to everybody's astonishment. After a couple of years of hard work, this system now makes a reasonably good prediction. Think of it as the first guess, okay, starting point uh, of the structure of protein. And then they did an interesting thing. They took the 200 million known proteins in the world, predicted their structures, and published it in an open source document that's available for free for anybody in the world. Okay? Now just think about it, right? Core technology in biological research, available at no cost to the tons of creative and talented innovative people working in these fields. I mean, it's, if you're a biologist, this is productivity improvement you know, on steroids. Um, DNA sequencing costs, I, I like this one just because it's interesting. So DNA sequencing costs are coming down like a lot of these other, other, other costs, uh, properly calculated. Followed Moore's Law. Every, you all know what Moore's Law is. It's the, the inner temporal pattern of semiconductor power. Um, and then, and then it deviated from Moore's Law and started dropping like a stone. So the original cost, I don't know, was 10 million. It's now $250 per sequence, core technology. Not so expensive that, you know, it, it's accessible. And I'll skip over these. These are the two women who run the Nobel Prize in, in uh, chemistry for discovering gene editing, another incredibly powerful and dangerous technology. And these are the recipients of the Nobel Prize this year in medicine and physiology. And th these are the two who discovered the, uh, the, basically the mRNA technology that lies behind the successful vaccines and a great deal of the targeted immunotherapy that's being used experimentally in cancer treatment successfully. And that's a global explosion. So why, let me, let me, I, let's close my introductory remarks with a few comments on why I think this is, the Gen AI in particular is transformational. This, first of all, it's not very old. This breakthrough came from a paper that was written at Google by people who were at Google in 2017. For non-technology people like me, it's kind of hard to read. It's full of acronyms, but it is uh, transformational. And so the question is, you know, what effect is it going to have? And so I want to just leave, leave you with simple propositions. I think it's going to produce an enormous surge in productivity. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but long term in our, in virtually everywhere in the economy, uh, subject to certain conditions. So I wrote a paper to that effect with James Manuke at Google, and it sort of lays out the argument. Um, and the argument's pretty simple. Uh, one, this is the first generation of AI that has what the, you might call domain switching capabilities, human-like domain switching capabilities. What do I mean by that? It means you can talk to it about a subject like the Italian Renaissance, and then you can change the subject to inflation and economics, and then you can ask it to write computer code, and you don't have to tell it that you're switching domains. It just knows, right? So that's one. And the second thing is you don't need any technical training to use it. Think of the large language models. You just ask it a question. This is completely different in both respects from all previous generations of AI. Um, and so the combination of accessibility and, and apparent applicability, regardless what the subject matter is, and it looks like a platform on which you can find applications and use cases pretty much everywhere in the economy, and that's been my experience, you know, customer service, you know, uh, writing first drafts, uh, coding, uh, you know, peering into things, Nurses' assistants, you know, just a powerful digital assistant working alongside you. Are we going to have a whole lot of automation? No, I don't think so. We, it depends. It's a little bit semantics, right? So take the doctor case. The AI is writing the first draft of this report this, you know, individual has to write every day. 
If you define the task as the first draft, yes, it's automation. The machine's doing it <laughs> and saving the doctor 80% of the report writing time. If you define the task as the report in its final form, then it's machine-human collaboration. You see what I mean. You can tie yourself in knots on the semantics, uh, you know, without kind of thinking very clearly about this. But I do, do believe the natural model, at least for a while, um, you know, given the state of these technologies and their pr probable uh, rapid advancement, um, is, is exactly this. Now we're in a period of intense experimentation and exploration. We'll stay in that state. What James and I are concerned about are really three things. One, avoiding the automation bias, this natural tendency to think, well, we should go around and fi try to find the jobs we can get rid of. That's a terrible way to use this. Um, and it isn't even the best way. The second one is, it's not right to assume that this technology will diffuse widely. Let, if, if, if you're gonna get the productivity surge, it's not good enough that it has a big, a big impact in the tech sector and finance, right? Because there's a lot of people working somewhere else in the economy. You need it to diffuse across the economy, and that means across sectors that tend to lead and lag, if historical experience in digital adoption tells us anything, and across a wide range of organizations, nonprofit, small, medium-sized businesses, and not all of them have either the knowledge or the resources to do what J.P. Morgan Chase is doing now, which is you know throwing a lot of money at trying to figure out how to use this. And this is a role for public policy, right? Whenever you have big structural change, it's usually unwise to write the government out of the script, and this would be a good example of that where you need a creative. The, the third thing we say in the paper, for those of you who are interested, it's, it's in foreign affairs in the last issue last year, um, is the policy agenda around this right now is heavily tipped toward the negative side effects of this, to risks, to misuse, to flooding the system with rubbish, you know, to privacy issues, to, well, what are we gonna do with copyright problems? I mean, the large language models just go around the internet hoovering up uh, pretty much everything, including things people have written, creative things, and so on. And the people, and the, you know, the people in Hollywood are right to say, is this okay, right? You know, what are its long-run consequences? We have to sort those things out. So there's a big agenda on the regulatory side. But if that's all there is, we're gonna skip the positive side, the, or the government's role and the policy role on the po positive side in the area of accessibility and diffusion. So we were simply trying to lean a little bit against the tip, the bias in the direction of the negative. It's pretty natural right now, I would say. Uh, I understand that the, first of all, part of the negative agenda is, you know, seriously there, and another part is perceptual, the kind of, you know, we won't have enough jobs. I'll close for some, a lot of you know a fair amount of economics. Um, so let me talk about jobs specific. Do you get a big productivity increase? <clears throat> uh, even if it's not flat out automation, okay? Well, if the demand, you know, doesn't rise somehow, you probably will reduce the number of jobs. And I have no doubt there's parts of the economy, sectors, where that'll happen. I'd be willing to bet a little bit of money anyway that the number of people writing media copy 10 years from now will be smaller than the number that are writing now. You know, if there's a whole bunch of people taking uh, newspapers and magazines and run one language and translating them laboriously into another, they probably won't be doing that uh, if what we just said about uh, the AI's ability to do that uh, extremely well is right. So then the question is, well, is the demand fixed or not, right? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, relatively inelastic is the term we use in economics. So the one that people, gets people's attention is software engineering. So there's gonna be a huge productivity increase in software engineering because it's writing the first draft code. And I think everybody acknowledges that, it's already happening. And so the question is, do we need fewer software engineers? And the instinctive answer sometimes comes back, yes. 
But then you think about it. We're building entire economies on essentially on software platforms. And so the notion that you know, we aren't going to need an awful lot of software, even with higher productivity and lower costs of development, seems to me at least something that you'd probably want to put a question mark over before you, you know, re jump to that conclusion. So beyond that, we can't get. We're just going to have to go down the road and figure it out. But there will be disruption and distributional consequences, and it'll be important not to ignore them, you know, because some people in various job classes will be sideswiped. It's just uh, probably at the macro level, you know, we're not going to end up short of jobs. This is my best guess. Well, no, maybe one more thing, okay? <laughs> this, by the, this is a really wonderful study. It was published last June by McKinsey Global Institute. It's called The Economic Potential of Generative AI, and it has relatively conservative estimates of the impact in, in economic impacts, and they're very large. You know, with conservative, you know, assumptions about the footprint of, uh, of Gen AI in the economy, you get p figures like $4.4 .4 trillion. I mean, they're just very, very large. And finally, there is a study done by um, my colleague at um, Stanford, Eric Bernolfsson's head of the Digital Economy Lab, and I'll try some, and some co-authors in MIT. And, the, and basically what they did is they found an, an organization, actually two, a consulting organization and a tech organization that was implementing AI in a customer service context. So this is tech-oriented products. Customer service people are has, ha, helping customers deal with problems, like I can't connect to the network or something. And what they did basically is take tens and tens of thousands of hours of audio recordings of customer service, customer interactions with performance measures like did they solve the problem or did the customer think they solved the problem? How long did it take? That sort of thing. Some, you know, n more, did they make the customer angry? That kind of thing. And then after they trained the algorithm, they gave it to half the customer service agents and not to the other half. And they were careful to give it to, on each side, you know, have it, not have it, a spectrum of customer service agents by experience, right? So that there's a learning curve here, as you would imagine. And the experienced ones tend to do better, <laughs> just even without an AI assistant. And then they looked at the results, and, so, and they're simply stated that productivity increase overall was 14%. It was nearly instantaneous. And the productivity increase for the least experienced people was 35%, because they didn't have to go down the learning curve, the AI, had figured it out by examining all these interactions. So essentially what it learned is what the experienced agents had learned through a more laborious process and then delivered it in a usable form to the under. So this is a kind of leveling up effect. I don't know, you know how general it's going to be, but I think it's not uh, an uninteresting uh, phenomenon in, terms, in distributional terms. And that really is enough for me. Thank you very much. Uh, you talked about how software engineers, and the moment you utter the phrase software engineers in this city, you know, hearts and minds are a flutter. Mm. And you said, well, why should we believe that uh, software engineers, the number of jobs, their jobs will go down? Mm -hmm. right? And then you also mentioned that uh, your guess is that the overall number of jobs uh, it will perhaps not go down, right? right? Can you describe that a bit? Why, why are you hopeful? I mean, why are you hopeful about that? Yeah, so let me try to answer, it's a very good question, try to answer that in a kind of uh, slightly modulated way, okay? So in, when I didn't describe to you the headwinds to growth and the supply side constraints, one of them, when you look at the advanced economies, especially the United States economy, is we have labor shortages everywhere, including in all the major employment sectors. And the older folks are retiring at a great rate, and the younger people have said, essentially, I don't want to work where it's inflexible, dangerous, stressful, low paid, so they aren't, and they don't have to. Uh, and so we need, if we're going to recover some of the supply elasticity and not just rely on the central bank to hack the demand side of the economy down, 
to get rid of you know the original trigger for inflationary pressures, we need uh, productivity growth. Now, I just spent a week here talking to a lot of people and you know government and researchers like all of you, and the situation here is completely different. There's <laughs> In some, res I mean, there's a lot, you can find labor shortages in various skill categories, but you're not, you wouldn't characterize the Indian economy as sort of overall short of labor. So I think what will happen when this powerful tools are put in the hands of uh, Indian entrepreneurs and technologists, they'll, they'll go after different problems, right? And so if they go after different problems, they probably won't go around automating a whole lot of stuff in a way that doesn't make sense. What I'm trying to say is the answer to this is context specific, right? You, can, you could probably produce a shortage of jobs if you systematically went out to do that. That is to, to set, allow the automation bias to run. My best guess is that that's not what's gonna happen, but I can't prove it. I mean, the only other thing I would say is I focused on productivity because everybody understands that and it happens to be matched to the conditions in the developed country, James and I did. But, uh, but a lot of the impact in dimensions that matter to people is gonna come elsewhere. You know, effectiveness of healthcare, longevity, quality of education, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, because it really is hard to find a place where there, you can't find the footprint of, of this kind of thing. So, I don't know. If I'm wrong, I'll come back in, uh, in five years and tell you I made a mistake. <laughs> so, you, you use that phrase a couple of times, automation bias. Yeah. Are there ways around it? Are there regulatory structures? Are there incentives that can be built? Are there governance mechanisms by which you could reduce, eliminate the automation bias? I think, if, if, so I doubt if you can re eliminate it by regulation, but, it, but there are ways to have it dealt with. So in the interaction of uh, management and everybody who works there, if labor has power, they'll push it in the direction of, you know, we have powerful tools, right? Uh, you, you know, or at least say, we've got to avoid just going around hunting for our jobs and getting rid of as many as you can. And, you know, and when you implement technology change, it, you, the technologists can't do it by themselves. I mean, you probably, you know, in the business schools here have courses, you know, on implementing, you know, changes in business models and so on, which has lots of soft skills associated with it, lots of communication and whatnot, going back and forth, agreeing, on the path forward. All of that could very well, you know, significantly modify a kind of initial bias in the direction of artificial, I mean, in, in the direction of automation. So I'm not too worried about it, but, but if, if you listen to the din right now in the popular press about this, you just can't get away from it. I mean, every second day there's an article in the Wall Street Journal about how dangerous this is in terms of white collar jobs and whatnot. So. Um, you know, I'm not, I feel like Don Quixote, <laughs> right? <laughs> sort of swiping away at windmills, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure we'll settle down and get a, a sensible version of this. Um, so what are the risks that you bother you most about AI? So there are a lot. Uh, one is flooding the system with, with essentially rubbish, you know, that people have great difficulty understand, you know, distinguishing from real content. Now, and I'm not sure the market mechanisms, you know, brands and so on that we rely on and trust to kind of solve informational problems like that. I'm not sure they're powerful enough to work. Uh, and, and then it's just the misuse. So I, the first, internationally, this may sound crazy, this is not economics, but these technologies have enormously powerful uses in national security, warfare, defense, and so on. Uh, and the first thing I've heard people suggest we ought to do is, you know, have a treaty and basically agree we will never use a fully autonomous weapon uh, so that there'll always be a human being somewhere. 
I mean, we're not there yet, but I mean, we're not that far away. Drones still have pilots, even if they're 5,000 miles away. That's, um, some people worry about that. I think there's ways to misuse that, but we're talking about fully autonomous, ones that are out there making decisions about who's gonna be killed and whatnot. I think we should get the, just take that off the table. The way we took nuclear weapons and biological weapons and chemical weapons off the table, it's just too dangerous. So that'd be a start. And then, you know, then we'll inch our way forward. <laughs> um, but, there, but there are lots of, you know, when you copyright, uh, there's a huge set of issues having to do with data. Um, and they intersect the AI stuff, although they're not confined to that. So, you know, there's data security, privacy, the responsible use of data. Uh, but in addition, you know, there's this, you know, desire to be assured about it. So it, there's a proliferation of laws that basically say all the big data collections, like the mega platforms have, have to be resident in the country where the citizens about whom the data is are. <laughs> that's not very well put together since, is it? Uh, and that's fine. I understand that. Uh, we're going to physically locate the data here so we control in some sense, or have more control over who has access to it. Global supply chains don't work very well because they're built on dig digital platforms, or increasingly they are, if you can't move data across the border, right? So there's a whole bunch of kind of quasi-practical issues um, that need to be dealt with, and that'll require international cooperation, maybe even new, new entities that, uh, that we have to deal with. So it's quite a long list of things that could could go wrong or cause an overreaction and will miss the upside benefits. So rubbish, data, warfare. Warfare. Yeah, rubbish, data, and warfare. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, if you were to look out ten years, so you wanted to add to the list? No, I was just saying rubbish, data, warfare. R D W. Okay. So rubbish, data, warfare. Yeah. So. What do you think, I mean, the, seeing the trajectory that you've seen over the past 10 odd years, the chart that we had, what do you think in 10 years' time AI won't be able to do? Well, so there's two th great debates going on, at least two or three. One has to, uh, this, if this is familiar to me, all of you, just stop me. Down the road somewhere, there's this concept of artificial general intelligence. That means essentially an AI that's like a human in the kind of full bore sense. Uh, and there's a debate going on about whether we'll ever get there. So when they ask the experts, they, you know, they're, they, they narrow in on somewhere between 10 years and never. That's a pretty big range. And, to, and then related to that, there's this notion that somewhere around down the road again, there's an existential threat. When this machines start, you know, sort of deciding what they're gonna do and writing their own code and all that kind of thing. We're not there yet, but I don't, I, and I guess I'm not, you know, I don't have nightmares about it. On the other hand, I don't think we should just dismiss it, right? Uh, although I tend to, th I mean, this is slightly irresponsible, what I'm about to say, but I tend to think it's more interesting to think about, you know, the the path we're going to take to wherever we're going to get, rather than having a wildly, you know, intense debate about what the world's going to be like 50 years from now, because who knows, right, is kind of the attitude I have. And it may be a little bit, I'm overboard on that, on that front. Um, so those are two, two principal sort of areas of kind of, if you might, might call, really important systemic kind of risk um, associated with these things. And the other thing we don't know is, you know, so ChatGPT had, you know, a couple billion parameters. ChatGPT4, I'm just picking on them. You know, I could be Bard and now Gemini at Google. Uh, uh, several billion. I know they're going to do it again. Enormous uh, amounts of computing power required to do this. I mean, you basically need the cloud computing platforms that the mega platforms have. What that means right now is all of them are in two countries, right? We don't have one in Europe that can, where we can train these algorithms. We can use the AIs 
but that's different from training them. So the academics, the researchers, you know, who are building these algorithms are going to have at least some limitations. And then, of course, we're busy trying to make sure China doesn't get the chips that are the ones you really need to do the training. Uh, I don't think that'll slow them down very much, but, but that's, again, a judgment call. But so we keep, we go up this thing, you know, we went chat GPT, chat GPT for m many more parameters, huge amounts of computing power, and now we're going to do it again. So from your point of view, it, does this curve keep looking like an exponential? Or does it some ter at some point, does it turn into an S curve? And if it turns in, meaning eventually adding parameters doesn't give you much. This in economics is called diminishing returns, right? Kind of a familiar concept. So you get increasing returns and then diminishing returns. We don't even know if that's going to happen or we'll just have an endless batch of increasing returns. And if it, we're going to get an S curve, we don't know when it's going to be, right? So that's a pretty big batch of uncertainty about how this is going to go in the future. So it's pretty clear what path we're going to go down, but we have no idea, you know, I don't think, about how it's going to turn out. Let me ask you a risk that worries me. I work with school education yes. a lot. And, uh, you know, all of us are lazy thinkers. Most of us, not lazy, not lazy thinkers. Not people like you, but we are mostly lazy thinkers. And uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the natural tendency is for the student and for the teacher to say, like, chat, chat GPT, give me the lesson plan. Mm -hmm. Give me the homework, yeah. right? And you can guard against that. You can have more creative assignments. You can do all kinds of stuff. But I see a risk of uh, getting into the habit of outsourcing thinking. Uh, I think it's a real risk. Outsourcing thinking itself. Yeah. And therefore, you start losing the capacity to develop thinking. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think about that? I agree with you. I think, you know, there's a serious set of things we need to work through in academia together about what's, what are the good and not so good uses of this. Uh, what I'm seeing is some people want it to go away while we figure it out, and other people want to, you know, you have waded right in and say, I want you to use this stuff, but I want you to use it in the with the following sort of conditions. Uh, one, you know, you are able to defend what the thing delivers for you. Two, you disclose it. It's just like footnotes. Uh, or otherwise, it'll be plagiarism. And I suppose and there's a kind of raging debate about how good the algorithms are for detecting, you know, AI-generated content you know, when you hand in the term paper and so on. So uh, we're not at the end of that. Uh, but but. But I completely agree that you can hand in B plus papers in a lot of different courses without actually either doing the work or understanding the material. And that kind of defeats the purpose. So as educators, we're going to have to find a way around that. Uh, maybe we're going to have to go back to tests where you're handed out a little blue book, you know, and you don't have your phone or your computer with you and you actually have to sit down and answer a question that you weren't told about beforehand. Maybe. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Some of the old methods are the best. Right. Okay. So I'm going to move a little bit from AI. Uh, perma crisis. Is that a word that you coined? Mm -hmm. I mean, no? I mean, it was the word of the year in 22 or 20? Word, word of the year in 2022, so we borrowed it. <laughs> There's poly crisis, perma crisis, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of words that are being invented to describe aspects of the evolving world we live in. You know, po poly, so we had multipolar and people didn't really want that, so now we have polyamorous, or, or I, can't, I can't remember, it's going on and on. But we picked perma permacrisis because it seemed to, for us to best capture the notion um, that we're having these three sets of things coming at us, you know, crises, shocks, and so on, structural change underneath, it's, that's not really captured in permacrisis, but we wanted to say that. Um, big changes requiring big changes in mindsets in the formulation of business strategy and policy, and then, uh, and then 
the fragmentation of the way the global economy is put together. I mean, uh, the, to me, oh, well, cer certainly the thing Gordon was most worried about, but I, I mean, I would I'm not far behind him, is that that world that we lived in where basically the global economy was constructed on efficiency and comparative advantage considerations and almost nothing more. I mean, I'm, that's a bit of an oversimplification. We did have the Cold War and a bunch of other things, but it was, that's, that was mainly it. And then uh, you got the emerging economy growth in a pretty benign environment. That world's just gone, right? We have national security significantly determining or overriding strictly economic considerations. You've got clear patterns of fragmentation. You have the tensions between the China, the rising power. I don't know how we'll do with India, because you're a rising power too. Uh, and the incumbent, namely the United States. You've got a, just a much more complicated, even sometimes contradictory, business and economic environment. And so all we wanted to say is, we don't want this, one, we can't go back to where we came from. These are realities we have to deal with. But we don't have to just mindlessly go down the road of sort of nationalism, unilateralism, bilateralism, marginalize the multilateral institutions, especially when we need them for certain purposes. We can do this in a more kind of gradual and thoughtful way and still be pragmatic and realistic. I mean, I think if Gordon were here, he would call this globalization light, okay? That is, it's not the full bore version we had, because we know we can't have that. Uh, and the other one is, there's no, nobody with any humility would say we can just fix this, there's no silver bullet. But we can avoid taking highly destructive steps uh, in the wrong direction. I mean, there's lots of anomalies. Let me give an example. Rob Johnson and I talk about this. Um, and Rob makes the point uh, that, you know, you can't explain the, and, and Montag Alawali makes the same point, you can't explain the, you know, the current tariffs that the United States imposes on China in economic terms, right? Because they don't make sense. I mean, if it's true, we're going to, you know, we need to restrict the flow of semiconductors, and maybe we needed sanctions, although it's highly controversial and dangerous, you know, as the response to the Ukraine-Russian conflict, um, with lots of negative long-run consequences to it. Uh, Trump put tariffs on everything, toys, you know, textiles, you name it, and Biden didn't take them off. And they, you can't defend what tax, t um, tariffs on toys on national security grounds. At least I haven't thought of a way to do it yet. And so, so the question, so you know, so the question is, why do we still have them? And the answer is political. It's got nothing to do with economics. It, the political answer in the American context is in this environment. The only thing that the Republicans and Democrats really agree on is that China's bad news. And. If you do something that's favorable to China, that's a bad thing to do politically. And so it hasn't been done, even though it makes full kind of economic sense. And a lot of people, I mean, it's not as if, you know, everybody up there is stupid. You know, Janet Yellen is not confused about this, and neither are a whole lot of other people. So it's just hard to move. It's the political reality. You sound, I mean, you, you have a sort of a very pragmatic, you know, approach that lets us do the common sense things right now, make the right choices. We don't know exactly where we're going on artificial intelligence or all the Perma crisis, right? And that's a refreshing change, you know. It's a refreshing change uh, from people who seem to know exactly where we are going, right? And yeah, I, th I think this is an environment in which it's very hard to know where we're going. So, you know, being finding the right balance between finding a sense of direction and suggesting what might be a beneficial sense of direction without going overboard and saying, you know, we know stuff that we can't know is is right. So, I, so take an example that we already talked about, and I'll just do it briefly. I think. If we're going to get the benefits of a, a, you know, a, a Gen AI in the economy, 
we want it to be fairly inclusive. You know, we should have flags up, you know, for making sure we're moving in that direction everywhere, including here. I mean, I think it's going to happen here. I mean, you know, just based on conversations I've had. And we, you know, and we want to uh, make sure it diffuses across the economy just to get the productivity effect. But I, I can't go get beyond that other than to try to make a convincing case that, it, you know, sector by sector, that it looks like there's some very interesting things to do. There's, you know, it, how do I say it? It's empirical, right? There's no theory that says AI will work in these areas and not in others. Um, anyway, yeah, so I, I think, I, I probably sound more optimistic than many people, but that's, it, but it has a time horizon on it. I think the next little while in the global economy is gonna be pretty tough. You know, China will un underperform for a while. Uh, Europe is really underperforming. Uh, we all are in the inflation fight. Um, in America, we are in better shape in terms of overall macro performance, but are in desperately bad shape in distributional terms with, I mean, unknown, but big, probably big negative consequences for political and social cohesion and or polarization, it's opposite. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you all know what the challenges are here, but I would say from an external point of view, the bright light <laughs> in the next little while in terms of performance in the global economy is going to be India and some of the Asian countries. China, China will probably take about least two, three years to kind of right the ship because of these imbalances are really very large. The real estate one, et cetera. How are we doing on time? Time to open up? Hmm? Maybe a couple of questions I can ask? Hmm. We should turn the lights up since I can't see anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Thank so, Mike. You. Yes. Uh, I was reading, uh, I think you, you gave an interview. You were talking about the uh, jobs issue in India. Right. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, what do you think about the issue of jobs in India? I mean, is Mike okay? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think the good news is I think that did, I've, I said this publicly, so I'll just repeat it. I think that di the architecture in the digital economy that has been put in place, especially on the financial side, is the best in the world. And I think it's going to be exported, and there's a, now a growing batch of evidence that I became aware of that there's lots of interest in it. I don't, no, I don't mean India is going to build other people's infrastructure. I mean the open model with the UPI, you know, and all of that is, I think, the right model and going to be replicated. China got there first in mobile payments uh, before any of us, I mean, including the advanced countries. But that architecture, you know, made two big private entities, you know, the repository of all the data and therefore the ability to do the credit scoring and all that stuff. And that's not the, that's not the model you want. Uh, and they were a threat to banks until they decided they weren't going to be, whereas this model basically takes the institutions there and voluntarily lets them in on a kind of level playing field. So I think it's a brilliant achievement. You have a burges burgeoning entrepreneurial ecosystem in multiple dimensions of the thing, partly because of the, the biometric identification system, partly because of this architecture, and a lot because the geo-revolution dramatically expanded the number of mobile internet users and the, the data rates. I mean, I'm, now I'm telling people who are all mostly Indian, so it was something you already know. You went from the highest data rates to the lowest data rates in, in the world almost overnight. And data rates really matter, right? So all of that looks terrific. So what do I mean by jobs? I do not think the overall growth dynamics yet have powerful enough employment engines in them to draw the vast majority of people who are in traditional sectors into the modern economy. Uh, I don't know what the answer is that is, but there is a distinct pattern of diversification in the global economy in response to shops, shocks. Part of that diversification is away from China. So China's exiting faster than they normally would, you know, just on the journey up the income scale. Apple now has 15% of their assembly here. Uh, 
with multiple entrepreneurs who built them elsewhere coming in to set up those operations. I think that's a good thing. It's not a permanent solution because in some areas, the digital technologies in manufacturing and assembly are pretty close to being more better in terms of cost than the labor intensive process oriented ones. And maybe electronics assembly is one of those areas. I would say textiles is still pretty hard because of because the machines, robots don't know how to handle cloth. I mean, it's a simple statement. Now, I've confirmed that. I've been asking people who've been trying and trying and trying to semi-automate the textiles and apparel industry, and they're working hard at it, and they believe they'll get there eventually, but they're not there yet. So I think that's one set of options. When people say, sort of, what's the answer? I say, I don't know. But when you have a lot of people to employ, you know, in a way that raises their productivity and is part important part of the growth strategy. My answer to the question is, what should we do? The answer is sort of everything we can think of, right? Like, try this, try that, you know, and just get on with it. But I would say, in a pretty br bright picture, I still think the the model that says, we have, we've invented a completely different growth model we can do it all on services. We don't really need the global economy that much. That's not a good strategy, is I guess the cautionary note. You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Center. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarona Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, Bangalore International Center, .org. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.